Our resource speaker is a Filipino-American molecular biologist and a Dominican priest. He was born on November 1, 1968. In the he attended the University of Pennsylvania where he earned a Bachelor of Science Engineering summa cum laude in 1989. In 1997, after a brief fellowship at the Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research at the University College of London, he entered the Order of Prior Scriptures and was ordained a priest for the province of St. Joseph in the United States. He has two doctorates, one in molecular biology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and one in moral theology from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. He is an associate professor of biology and professor of theology at Providence College, Rhode Island. He is also the founder and chief researcher at the Osteatico Laboratory. Majority of his work focuses on the development of stem cells, cell apoptosis, and the role of science in religions. Father Osteatico is currently a visiting professor of biological sciences at the University of Santo Tomas, Manila. And last year, 2020, Father Nicanor has started to bring his molecular biology expertise into the fight against COVID-19 with a project on yeast-based oral vaccine for Filipinos. As a fellow of the OCTA research team, he is very much involved in pandemic management for the Philippines. Let us all welcome Reverend Father Nicanor Austriaco, OP. Good morning, uh, Excellencies from the United States. I actually arrived here just two nights ago. I will be here for one month uh, working in my laboratory before I return to the Philippines. So I have prepared a 10 minute presentation on the science and ethics of the COVID-19 vaccines. At this, after the presentation, I will be very happy uh, to answer any questions you may have on the COVID-19 vaccines or on COVID-19 as an infection uh, with a special emphasis in the Philippines. So my presentation is going to be divided into three parts. First, I would like to, to uh, inform you on how the COVID-19 vaccines actually work because it's really important that you understand why vaccines do what they do. We will then discuss the COVID-19 vaccines that will be available in the Philippines, both uh, with a special emphasis on the moral dimension of some of these vaccines. I will then conclude with a discussion of a timeline for the COVID-19 vaccine arrival in the country. I currently serve on two vaccine procurement and deployment task forces one for, the, for Quezon City, the largest city in the country, and second for the city of Las Piñas, where my mother actually works. So hopefully I will be able to help you to understand the challenges and struggles that we will have over the next year as we attempt to vaccinate the Filipino people. So this is an image of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that is responsible for COVID-19. And I show it to you because we are going to refer back to this picture uh, several times during this presentation. So we'll begin by talking about the COVID-19 vaccines and how they work. So the key take home message here is that antibodies destroy SARS-CoV-2. And the reason why the pandemic has been so uh, devastating around the world. So as of yesterday, 100 million people have been uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 in, in less than a year. Uh, and the reason why we are so vulnerable to COVID-19 is because no one has any antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And so the goal of the vaccines is to help our bodies to make these antibodies that will destroy SARS-CoV-2. And this is a picture uh, a very famous picture. This is Helen Keenan. She is 91 years old and she's the first person to be vaccinated against uh, COVID-19 in the UK. 
Uh, she was vaccinated uh, in the middle of December. And what people may not realize is that the nurse who vaccinated her is actually a Filipina who had been serving at the National Health Service of the United Kingdom for 25 years. So returning back now to the picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what I would like to point out to you, and it's encircled in red, is um, what is called the spike protein. And the spike protein is a bump on the surface of the virus. So if you took your hand and you touched the skin of the virus, what you would see on the surface of the virus is about 75 of these spike proteins. And the spike protein is used by the virus as a key to enter each one of our cells. It is also the part of the virus that is being used to generate the vaccines that we are currently deploying around the world. And so there are several kinds of vaccines that are being deployed, but the major idea behind these vaccines is we take the spike protein that covers the surface of the virus and we inject that into your body or we inject the information that will allow your body to make just that protein. So there is no living virus that is injected directly into you. Um, if they do that, and the Chinese vaccines have that approach, the virus has been killed before it is injected into your body. So which vaccines will be available in the Philippines? I would like to begin by just pointing out a very important ethical consideration. So this is a picture of HEC-293 cells. And these are the cells that were obtained from the remains of an aborted female fetus in 1972 in the Netherlands. So these are the cells that remain. So there's, there is no part of the fetal body other than cells that were descended from um, fragments of this uh, child's kidneys. And what is important to know is that some of the vaccines were made using these cells. And I wanted you to see the cells because so many people imagine that what you are dealing with here are parts, uh, visible parts of a fetal body. And some people I know have asked me whether or not there are baby parts actually inside the virus. And one of the things I want to show you is that these are the cells that were used to make the vaccine, but none of these cells are actually injected into you. They were used during manufacture, but they are destroyed uh, in the process of making the vaccine. And I'm going to indicate vaccines that were made with these aborted cell lines, these aborted cells, with this icon, this orange icon of an unborn baby human fetus. Now, uh, in terms of the church's uh, teaching on this, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith released a note on December 21st, and I am quoting this text here for your reference. Um, and basically what the most important part is the part in red. So the Holy See has said the following, it must therefore be considered that in such a case, all vaccinations recognized as clinically safe and effective can be used in good conscience with a certain knowledge that the use of such vac vaccines does not constitute formal cooperation with the abortion from which the cells used in the production of the vaccines derives. So I would, I'm going to simply end here and I can discuss this document from the CDF with you further during the question and answer session. However, when I teach this in my class, so I am a moral theologian, so I teach classes in moral theology, um, when people talk about formal cooperation or formal appropriation uh, with evil acts in the past, I point out that Roman roads were constructed by slaves many thousands of years ago. 
And I asked the question, may a virtuous tourist, may a Catholic bishop walk on these roads that were constructed by slaves 2,000 years ago without implicating themselves in slavery? And we understand today that because the event happened 2,000 years ago and that, that we are morally distant from the slavery that was used to construct these roads. And so we do not have moral problems with Catholic bishops or Catholic people walking on the streets of Rome. It would be different if our walking on these streets led to future acts of slavery. And so what the church has determined and moral theologians are in agreement is that because the abortion happened in the past and the use of uh, vaccines for reasons I can explain during the question and answer will not lead to future abortions, then we may avail ourselves of these vaccines for grave reasons, uh, including and especially ending the pandemic in the same way that we can walk on Roman roads that were constructed by slaves uh, thousands of years ago. So returning now to the vaccines for the Philippines, this is a map that I obtained online that will identify the vaccines that we are expected to receive in the Philippines. I'm going to divide them into three categories. So the first category are the vaccines we will expect to receive from the West. So correct, right now we have Moderna and Pfizer and AstraZeneca. So these are the three vaccines, more about them shortly, but these are the three vaccines that have currently been approved for distribution around the world from the West. We also have the Gamalaya vaccine from Russia. And then we have two vaccines that have been approved by different countries, Sinovac and Sinopharm from China. So these are the major categories. And I would like to go over each one of them now. So these are a, this is a chart to compare the different vaccines. Uh, these are the, the vaccines produced in the West and the following slide will add the information from the Chinese vaccines. So what you will see here are the first two that were approved were Moderna and Pfizer. They're about 95% effective uh, and they have to be given in two doses separated by either three weeks or four weeks. Now the challenge of these vaccines in the Philippines is especially that the Pfizer vaccine must be transported and stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. This is colder than the temperature in Antarctica. And so in the Philippines, we do not have sufficient freezers and refrigerators to store these vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine. Now Moderna vaccine can be kept in a regular freezer for ice cream or for frozen meat for uh, up to six months. Uh, we then have the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Russian Gamalaya. Both of these can be kept at regular fridge temperatures, but both of these were made using uh, fetal cell lines from the, aborted, from the abortion in 1972. With regards to uh, effectiveness or efficacy, you can see that Moderna, Pfizer, and the J Russian vaccines are relatively good. The AstraZeneca ranges from 60 to 90 percent. The standard approved protocols in the United Kingdom is 62 percent, is what we would be expected to use here in the Philippines. With regards to the Chinese vaccines, um, neither of these have, are morally controversial. They actually are made up of dead virus. Uh, their efficacy ranges from 50 to 91 for Sinovac and Sinopharm is 78%. They can be kept in a regular refrigerator like the refrigerators you find in your home. And so this is one of the advantages of this vaccine uh, in the Philippines. Now, in terms of price, so let me just, uh, this is a price list of the vaccines that, that was released by Senator Sonia Angara's office. 
we have learned since then that the government is negotiating specific prices for each vaccine uh, based upon their bilateral uh, uh, agreements with the vaccine companies. What is most important to see though is the, the cheapest vaccine that is currently approved is AstraZeneca. And that was, the one, that was the vaccine that was made in the United Kingdom using the fetal cell lines. And uh, I know because uh, Quezon City bought these vaccines and so did Las Piñas at a discount rate of about 500 pesos per Filipino. Um, Moderna and Sinovac. So we have been told by Senator, by Secretary Galvez that the Sinovac vaccine, even though the list price is 3,600 pesos, the Philippine government was able to purchase it for around 600, between 600 and 700 pesos per person. Now, I, I point this out because what became very clear during the negotiations for these vaccines over the last uh, month or so is that the poorest Filipinos will be receiving vaccines, uh, pri primarily AstraZeneca, um, that were created using the fetal cell lines. We also expect that the, Filip the poorest Filipino will receive uh, Sinovac and, and Sinopharm and probably Gamalaya as well from Russia. Let me explain why. Uh, by this final part, the COVID-19 vaccines, when will they arrive in our country? So the first thing you have to realize is that in 2021, there will be a significant shortage of vaccines uh, produced in the West. So there are 7.8 billion people living uh, on the planet at this time. Uh, given the best manufacturing capacity of all the Western vaccines, not including the vaccines from China, uh, we will only be able to produce about 5.6 uh, for doses for 5.6 billion people. That means 2.2 billion people still will not have the ability to receive vaccines. And this is why the Chinese vaccines play such an important role in fulfilling global supply. You will see that the majority of the vaccines were bought by five groups, the United States, the European Union, England, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. Just these five um, groupings were able to purchase 80% of all the vaccines that the West will produce. What this means is that there are only 800 million Western vaccines available for the rest of the world. This is why you will see, if you see in the news, why the Philippines is focusing on Chinese vaccines. So there's a lot of people going, why are the Philippine, Philippine government focusing on Russian and Chinese vaccines. It is because of this. There are not enough Western vaccines to cover the entire planet. So most of the developing countries, most of the resource poor countries have had to reach out to China and to Russia in order to buy our vaccines. Now, in terms of possible deployment, we expect the first batch of vaccines to arrive in the Philippines next month in February. Uh, this will come from the World Health Organization. This is the COVAX facility. There will, this will be primarily Western vaccines. It will allow us to vaccinate about 3% of the Filipino population, which will cover first and foremost the medical frontliners because they are most at risk. We then expect the majority of the vaccines to begin arriving at the earliest around June, probably in July. So June, July, until December, we expect most of the vaccines to arrive by then. Now, the Philippines has categorized priority lists in the following way. So I will, so the World Health Organization provided a list a priority list, and the Philippine government has also complied with that list. 
So first priority will go to frontline health workers. This is justified morally because they have the highest risk of contact of, of clinical exposure to COVID-19. And if our, our frontline health workers are sick, they are not able to provide care for everyone else. So this is about 0.57% uh, of the Philippine population. The second priority is senior citizens. And the national government has prioritized within that group, the indigent senior citizens first. So in Quezon City and in Las Piñas, currently these two LGUs are conducting a uh, census to identify all the senior citizens, especially the, the poorest senior citizens. You have to know that this is unlike any other country in the entire world. So most other countries will prioritize senior citizens, but not the poorest first. The third priority in the, uh, in the national government scheme is all of the other poor. So the remaining indigent population, another 12%. Again, this is unprecedented in the entire world. And this is actually, uh, the, the national government has justified this. And this would be supported by Catholic, so, uh, Catholic social teaching that the poorest of the poor are most vulnerable and most at risk for the long-term detrimental effects of the pandemic. And the fourth priority is essential workers and outside health, um, he health individuals um, and education. And um, what is interesting is an argument can be made that our priests will fall on the fourth priority because of their high exposure to large groups of people. Now to conclude my presentation before I open to questions, I just want to highlight the challenge, the enormous challenge of this vaccination. Um, it will be the largest and most complicated public health effort in the history of our country. It will especially benefit the poor and most vulnerable amongst us. To give you a sense of what must be done, we have to vaccinate at least 75 million people to end the pandemic in the Philippines. This is every single Filipino adult. And the reason why is because the, Filipinos, the Philippines is a relatively young country. So 30 to 35% of Filipinos are 17 years or younger, and the vaccines are not approved for them. So in order to vaccinate the 70% of the population that we need to end the pandemic, we have to vaccinate basically every Filipino. Every Filipino adult has to be vaccinated. The, the particular logistical challenge is we will have to vaccinate most of them twice within a month. I can tell you already that the LGUs where I, uh, in, uh, where I consult, this is the largest challenge. How do you convince Lolo and Lola who live in a slum to come back to the hospital or to come back to the vaccination center 28 days after they were vaccinated. So most Filipinos believe that when they are vaccinated once, tapos na. But for this particular COVID-19, they must be vaccinated twice. So we have, to, we have to vaccinate them once, send them home, and then we have to find them 28 days later and bring them back. And then we have to vaccinate the second batch while we are still vaccinating the first batch. And then we have four or five or six different vaccines, and we have to vaccinate the first, the, the person with the same vaccine. So one of the things that we are developing now is the data capacity to keep track of the 75 million Filipinos that will have to be vaccinated. And the particular challenge is I have been involved in trying to understand vaccine hesitancy we were able to deploy a survey around the country. We are now have 10,000 responses. And 40% of Filipinos say that they are not sure if they will be vaccinated. If we do not vaccinate 40% of the adults, 
the pandemic will not end. We will continue to have a pandemic every single year. We will have lockdowns every three months in order to keep this under control. This is why it is such a difficult logistical problem and it's such a critical problem for our country. And so uh, I would like to make two requests to you excellencies. First, I humbly ask that the bishops of the Philippines uh, consider adding the intention to the Oratio Imperata that we are already praying for um, to beg God to bless our efforts to end the pandemic. And second, and this is what I know because I, I, I talk to the poorest people, they are scared. And so they are so scared to be vaccinated. And it breaks my heart because they're the most vulnerable ones, the oldest ones, the poorest ones, and they are terrified. And so I ask that the bishops of the Philippines that you consider being vaccinated on TV alongside the mayors of your LGUs because we are trying, you know, so at UST, we are trying to, uh, we have started a campaign, a public awareness campaign to help the Filipinos to understand vaccines. But one of the things we have discovered is that science is not enough. They do not trust science, but they trust their bishops. And so it's most important that the church uh, help the country to fight this pandemic. Otherwise it will not end. This is, this is the challenge we have. If 40% of the Filipinos do not vaccinate, we will not be able to end this pandemic and they will have to be vaccinated every year in order to keep this, this, this pandemic at bay. So you can imagine, you know, I have been working on this for eight months now and the last two months on the vaccines. And it is so heartbreaking to, to talk to Filipinos who are terrified about the vaccines, but it's so important for them to, to be vaccinated. So um, thank you so much. I'll be open to questions.